welcome, uh, uh, please welcome all the way from London Zoo, Rosie Woodruff. Yes. <laughs> Well, look, thank you very much for the applause. But actually, to be yes, no thanks for asking me to do this. <laughs> I feel like Anne Widdicombe asked to go and strictly come dancing. Like, you're all just here to laugh at me fail. Because this event is all about communicating science to non-scientists. And I have empirical evidence that this is something I'm really bad at. I know this because I've spent many years trying to explain my own research on badgers and tuberculosis to policymakers in England. <laughs> well, the good news is the government is using my research. <laughs> They're using it to justify doing the exact opposite of what I suggested that they should do. Um, so this evening, I would like to have one last try at trying to communicate science. And I'd like to try to communicate a very basic concept uh, in science. Uh, it's no surprise that people struggle with understanding the science, because partly I think it starts with the language that we use as scientists. Scientists have a reputation for talking in you know, impenetrable jargon that no one can understand. But actually, we do something a little bit more subtle. We hijack terms words that other people think they understand and use them to mean something different. For example, I read a, a, a paper in an ecological journal the other day which claimed that a particular species of sea lion was declining due to something called bottom-up forcing. <laughs> if you're not an ecologist <laughs> and you don't know what that is, well, maybe don't Google it. <laughs> So I want to talk to you about uh, controls. Controls is a, you know, is a very basic concept in science. But people know what a control is. Right? We all know the word control. There's, there's self-control. I don't have a great deal of it, but I know that there's such a concept. Uh, what other control? Um, ground control to Major Tom. Um, a runaway train with no one at the controls. And the only passenger is Owen Patterson. <laughs> So controls, we all know what a control is. So it's not surprising perhaps that policymakers find it confusing when you say to them, well, the, what we need to do is we want to understand whether we can control cattle TB by controlling badgers. And to do that, we need to compare places where we control badgers with other places where we don't control badgers. And we're going to call the places where we don't control badgers control areas. <laughs> Because as scientists, we're sort of used to the idea that control means, you know, more than one thing. And it can also mean a comparison group, something, some place or some animal or some group of people which you, 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 to which you don't do the thing that you're interested in. Uh, why would you do that? Surely, if I want to know whether killing badgers controls TB in cattle, what I should do is just kill a bunch of badgers and see what happens to the cows. Why do I have to mess around with places where I don't kill badgers? Like, what is the point of that? Well, to try to um, explain this concept, why it's important, why you get confused if you don't have a control, I want to give you an example. So come with me, if you will, to the Rocky Mountains of North America. The year is 1995. Some time ago, it's a happy time, an innocent time, <laughs> yes, Bill Clinton was president. It was a happy, innocent time. And, <laughs> and the, um, the, the, the woods have been rid of a curse. The wolves and bears that used to rampage around the area, savaging things, were all humanely removed about half a century before. Little girls with red hoods, other little girls with golden locks, can visit their grandmothers and, and steal porridge without any problem. There's no, nothing to fear. Let me introduce you now to a scientist, Professor Joel Berger. Now, Joel Berger sees this, and he has a burning question. He sees the little innocent girls frolicking around. He wants to know, is life... <laughs> that wasn't meant to be funny. Is... <laughs> He wants to know, because he's interested in one thing, he wants to know, is life so tranquil for the local 
moose. <laughs> Do the moose gamble around gathering flowers with the little girls, forgetting, <laughs> forgetting the wolves and bears which killed and ate their ancestors generations before, just like they ate Little Red Riding Hood's grandmother? Or are they still vigilant, waiting, prepared for the time when some lefty government decides to experiment with something called rewilding? <laughs> so to answer this question, Joel Berger designed an experiment. It's very clever. He decided that he would show moose smells of wolves and bears and see if they ran away. Now, it was easy. It was easy to do this because it was winter. You know, it snows a lot in the mountains. He could make little snowballs. He could sprinkle them with wolf urine and gently lob them <laughs> at the moose he wanted to study. So, easy. Well, OK, so there was a little challenge because, you know, maybe the moose might be a little frightened by a professor coming and throwing snowballs at them. So, but that was easy, that was easy. All he needed to do was dress up as a moose <laughs> while he was doing it. So this is what he did. He, you know, he dressed up as a moose, he urine soaked snowballs, threw them at the moose. Easy. Problems. Well, no, there's still a problem because being a perceptive and well-trained scientist, Joel Berger recognised that there was a small you know, worth considering risk that a moose faced with a professor, university professor, wearing false wobbly antlers and throwing snowballs might make the moose run away. <laughs> wolf pee or no wolf pee? <laughs> what did he need? He needed the answer to almost every problem in science. He needed a control, a scientific control that would tell him that the moose were responding to the wolf pee. What he needed was to do exactly the same thing, sometimes, many times, sometimes with the wolf present and sometimes without. In fact, even better, what he really could do with is doing the same thing sometimes to, to use some other kind of, of, of mammal urine. Something else, some, some readily available, easily accessible, <laughs> cleverly, you know, something he could carry conveniently, humanely, <laughs> cleanly up into the mountains with him and present to the moose in just the way as he presented the wolf urine. Where could he find such a thing? <laughs> So that is how it came to be that the taxes of honest, hard-working Americans <laughs> were spent by the National Science Foundation on a university professor dressed in a moose suit, making snowballs out of his own urine <laughs> and throwing them at unsuspecting wildlife. <laughs> this is all true. <laughs> it is. <laughs> So, the, this sounds great, but it worked. <laughs> it actually worked. So, where the uh, where where moose were were were, used, were living alongside wolves, they ran away from the wolf urine soaked <laughs> snowballs. And, you know, and that could tell you, and that could just tell you that you know Joel Berger looks nothing like a moose, which I could have told him for free without all that outlay of taxpayers' money, but. What was interesting was the controls, because they didn't run away from his urine. <laughs> so we know that moose can tell the difference between a predator, because he did it with more than one thing, between a predator and something that actually wasn't that dangerous. We, he learned from that that, uh, that, that, that these, will, these moose were prepared. They did understand. They could tell the predator they could respond appropriately by running away. And, uh, and that's, that set the stage for rewilding. 20 years later, the, the wolves are indeed back and the moose are still there. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why we need controls. It, controls are what help us understand how we know that MMR doesn't cause autism, that homeopathy doesn't really cause anything. <laughs> and yes, it is how we know that culling small numbers of badgers does increase cattle TB. It's nothing to do with badgers moving the goalposts. <laughs> unless we can convince this, unless we can explain this to policymakers, then I'm afraid control, control, we have a problem. Thank you. That was wonderful, Rosie Woodruff.